Welcome back to The Breakfast and Plus TV Africa. Uh, we take you through the pages of our national dailies. We call it Off the Press. And as always, we'll have a guest join the conversation. But I'd like to start off with the leadership newspaper. The emphasis this morning will be on the top stories. Let's look at um, the banner caption for the leadership newspaper. 2023 presidency. Sanusi makes case for competence, merit, as politicians review zoning argument. Ohanese opposes zoning arrangements and wants PDP will collapse if party zones ticket to North. Says Jonathan lost 2015 election for not respecting zoning agreement. Stakeholders push for lower borrowing to fund budget. Uh, was talking about the 2022 budget here. And Senate traces defunct PHCN's hidden 14 billion naira in banks. APC crisis, Buni to meet Gombe stakeholders over party structure. And you also find Vice President Yemi Oshiban joined Ghana for ECOWAS submit. Meiti Allah replies or Tom over terrorist tags. We won't forget sacrifices of our armed forces. The governor of River State is quoted here some week. I mean, this is some of the headlines on the leadership this morning. All right. To the Nigerian Tribune, the big story there says APC may adopt consensus ahead of February convention. Half of the government spent about 56.9 billion naira on women and youths in 2021 fiscal year. Bandits release additional 30 students in Kebi after six months. A man, 76, a fake security agent in NDLEA net over imported drug chocolates, cookies and others. And process to authenticate next Ulubadon continues tomorrow. Still on the Tribune, five years after Abuja airport closure, federal government fails to construct second runway. DSS invitation plots to silence Bishop Kuka. And that's from Sokapu. Uh, two years after deadline, more than 50% of Nigerians' uh, private school teachers still unqualified, says the TRCN. Uh, those are the big stories on the Tribune this morning. Away from the Tribune, let's quickly check out uh, the Punch newspaper. And on the punch, the caption reads, Enforce compulsory vaccination for local government, state workers, federal government tells governors. You also have the NPHCDA urges states to set up mass vaccination sites in market, others. Vaccination grounds at 4.2%, 38 deaths recorded first week January. Uh, this uh, the board headline and uh, the banner. I mean the riders you find underneath the board caption. Capital importation falls by 1.68 trillion naira, says CBN. And federal government issues Lassa fever alert. Death toll hits 102 cases, now uh, 4,632. You also have Senate probe 14.7 billion naira. PHCN privatization fund in secret account. Federal government excessive borrowing from CBN threatens exchange rate orders. That's according to a report. And just before we move away, you also find commercial bus driver stabs uh, lover's husband to death in Ogun. And uh, grandpa Brazil returnee, undergraduate arrested with cocaine and tramadol and cab uh, cannabis. Now, this is some of the headlines on uh, the Punch newspaper this morning. Stabs a lover's uh, husband to death. Yes, yeah, so I, I think I saw that story yesterday. Sad one. Some people don't know their place. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on to the daily independent newspapers. Let's see what we can find over there. The big story, uh, of course, is on your screen. It says, yeah, 2022 budget on shore revenue raises a risk of higher fiscal deficit. Nigeria's debt bu uh, burden widens among, amid uh, poor budget funding, say analysts. Say the country's debt service uh, to revenue ratio highest in Africa. It will be a grave mistake not to release Kanu, says IPOB. 14.7 uh, billion naira defunct PHCN funds hidden in banks uh, uncovered. Stakeholders doubt rebirth of national carrier in three months. I am sure it will come on board, says Aligbe. And also Nigeria in need of comprehensive youth policy. On convention, APC governors divided, shift meeting with Buhari. And also Buhari should back the APC to zone presidency to southeast, says 
VON uh, Director General. Uh, before we, I mean, our guest joins us, just to quickly mention that um, once again, um, and one of the things that we're going to be talking about today uh, is the killing of about 200 people in Zamfara State a few days ago. And it is not even in the headlines this morning. And that basically is telling you how Nigerians and the Nigerian government has moved on, you know, after 200 of its citizens were killed. And I'm not sure how that makes anybody feel because, yes, it may not have happened in Lagos or in Abuja or in, you know, in Port Harcourt, you know, wherever you might be watching us from this morning. But it happened in Nigeria and these are Nigerian citizens. And the Nigerian government simply has, or seemingly, has moved on after about 200 of its citizens were killed by bandits or terrorists or whichever name that you, you, know, you choose to give them. It, it didn't even make the papers. And I, I saw someone uh, share uh, his thoughts yesterday asking, what country really does this type of you know, thing happen? In what nation across the world do you hear of 200 deaths in 48 hours, 96 hours, and everybody just moves on? It doesn't even make headlines 48 hours later. And it's not a country that is necessarily, you know, has agreed that it is at war. You know, if you're hearing about this in, in Ethiopia, you know, when, where there's a Tigray forces fighting government and the likes, then you can say, okay, well, um, you know, casualties of the war going on over there. If, it's, it's, if, if, if it is a war-torn country, maybe in the Middle East. But even in those countries, you do not hear of 200 people dead in two days or three days. Even in the worst situations that you can imagine in the last couple of years, four, five, six, ten years, that there has been an actual war in a country, you still do not hear that 200 people were killed. So this is no longer Nigeria dealing with a banditry issue. This is no longer, you know, Nigeria having bandits or terrorists or whatever, whichever name that you try to call them. We are at war with people that we've not been able to identify, with people that the Nigerian government has not been able to properly explain who they are. Um, and the victims of this war, the citizens in Zamfara and Kaduna and the northwest and the northeast eastern region, um, the Nigerian government on a Monday morning still has not put out any statement, any word with regards to the death of 200 citizens. I think it was on Friday that it was uh, the report that 147 bodies had been found. Some of the papers said 143 bodies had been found. Um, on Saturday, the Nigerian government um, in the news, you know, agreed that 58 people were killed according to government figures. But those people who are on ground will say completely different, say otherwise. It's way more than 58. But even if it's seven, even if it's three. Even if it's one. Even if it's one person. You know, 200 Nigerian citizens passed in the most gruesome way, not in a pandemic. Not because there was an Ebola outbreak in Zamfara. Not because there was an earthquake in, in Zamfara. Not because there was some natural disaster or tsunami. And the Nigerian government has moved on. Doesn't even acknowledge the death of these 200 people. Doesn't even address the Nigerian citizens with regards how disastrous this is. This is the same Nigerian government and these are the same persons in government today that ran down the previous government because of its own failures with regards to insecurity. The persons today that you hear about that are currently in government and those who are maybe also quiet, there's one of them that currently is now hosting um, vlogs and interviewing persons every, every week. But those voices were extremely loud when there were ins insecurity challenges in the previous government. And it's not saying, you know, that it's a, it's a, it's, this is not a PDP. The comparison, thing. yeah. But how come we can lose 200 persons and we've moved on? And, 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 and you know, States. also, just like I mentioned, you know, you have um, governors. I mean, apart from the fact that you're expecting to hear a statement from the federal government, you're also asking yourself, you know, the governors in this region, mm -hmm. uh, 19 of them, no statement whatsoever. And these killings are, you know, still, it's really sad, you know, that number, um, very unfortunate. It, it continues to just shows that 
uh, we do not have regard for human life. And it shows, you know, via, you know, the actions that we have as a people. I mean, what we act, because what, what you believe you become, and of course you begin to act, you know, what you believe. And this is really sad. So, so at, at this point in time, you begin to question yourself. When you have, um, you know, countries, I mean, others begin to treat you. Because sometimes you find the issue of police brutality outside of Nigeria, right? And we constantly will be screaming on top of our voices and saying, oh, that's unfair, that's unfair. But you see, it just shows you that the way we regard ourselves, the way we have, um, you know, decided to treat ourselves. I mean, uh, you want to ask, say, the, the, the issue of uh, why, be, why are we being docile at this point in time? Why are we being dumb? Why is the government not speaking? I mean, those who committed these crimes, can we not identify them? Did this, uh, did this person come from, fall from the sky? These are some of the questions you want to well. begin to ask yourself. Did this person fall from the sky? Because I, I feel that over time, the fact that our bo the body language of the government across board has not been in, 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 in such that it wants to address the issue, has continued to embolden these persons, these terrorists, these bandits, to continue, uh, no. you know, to go on, you know, perpetrating all of this evil. Okay. If you have a case where this has happened and you have people being arrested, is it a, a question of the fact that you have the infrastructure not functional? Is it that the, the, the structures are not, uh, there's no, they don't have the capacity to ensure and enforce arrest. Well, let's, uh, let's, this let's, is some let's, of the let's concerns. Bring in, um, let's bring in Opunabo Inkotaria, who's uh, joined us via Zoom. Uh, good morning, Mr. Inkotaria. If you can hear us, I'm not sure we can't uh, hear you. Mr. Inkotaria, can you hear us clearly? Well, while, we, while we try to uh, uh, make that connection uh, work, um, you know, that's very likely one of the things. It's not in the news this morning, but I will bring it up first, you know, and, you know, and ask what exactly, you know, we're doing, you know, as a country. Uh, where are we going, you know, and at what level will it become too much? Because, you know, one of the things that you mentioned earlier was fatigue. The Nigerians have heard these stories too many times. We've, we've de dealt with death too many times. Um, and so it's no longer, you know, a trending story. Uh, Ms. Aikutara, good morning once again. Can you hear us? Good, mo good morning. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can, loud and clear. Thanks for joining us. So I, I want us to start with um, what we're currently discussing, and that is the silence from the Nigerian government, from the Nigerian people, from the National Assembly, everybody who really, and of course includes governors in, in, in the north, um, after the death of about 200 persons in Zamfara uh, a few days ago. It's Monday morning, no word anywhere. Well, as, as sad as it is, uh, I think uh, Nigerians are beginning to be ignored. They are, they are getting accustomed to the concatenation of death, murder, assassination taking place in this country. Uh, but uh, I don't think that is enough reason for the media not to publish, because the media have this responsibility to unearth and bring forth national issues, issues of human interest and what have you. On the issue on the side of the government, uh, I don't expect anything more because we have a government, like I keep saying, it's almost sounding like a broken record. We have a government that is insensitive. We have a government that is callous. We have a government that does not care about uh, the ordinary man, the ordinary Nigerian. You know, I told persons, I said, we have a system where you have capitalism for the poor and socialism for the rich. Whatever happens to the poor is your bloody business. Whatever happens to the masses is your bloody business. But if one minister dies today or loses everybody close to him, you see all of them rallying around. So that is a situation the pathetic situation Nigerians have found themselves in. So I think I'll enjoy journalists, of course I'm one of you, I'll enjoy journalists not to fail in their duty because they shall remiss should they not publish these issues. These are human lives, like you people rightly said, we are talking about. Well, like it's, a, it's, it's, it's not really just one person. Yeah. Sorry? It's not made headlines. You, you, if you're re, with regards to uh, journalists and the media and the responsibility that they should have, it's not made headlines this morning, and that's that's the point. Most of the stories this that's morning in, said, in the I news. Said, I, I, I enjoy journalists. 
not to repudiate the obligation. That's what I said. Yeah. I said they should not. Yeah, because it, it, it's definitely repudiated. You're checking your responsibility to the society because that is what you owe the society. Any information of national interest, of human interest. Consequence, I don't want to go into new determinants. You know that. So it's our responsibility as journalists to bring to fore these issues. But what I said, and that's what I'm enjoying them, and probably they, don't, they didn't bother to make it headline news, but even if they don't make it headline news, it should be reported. But they didn't bother because I tell you today, even if you publish that 500 persons have been massacred, that will not sell your paper anymore. It could take, it could take the form of a bottom strip or whatever, but it will not sell your paper anymore because people are not to it. The deaths come to take place on daily basis, if not an hourly basis, in this country. And we have an insensitive government. So I don't even expect a state. In fact, the government will not want to say anything on that because they believe that that will be further publicizing it. So they want to remain news and they fight as the government. But that does not mean that the journalists will check his own responsibility. It is absolutely wrong. These are things that should be reported. That's why I enjoin them. I beseech them not to be discouraged, not to be disillusioned. And we should not allow financial gain. In other words, if the paper is going to sell or not, we should not allow financial gain, you know, override, declare our reasoning, our sense of judgment. We should not allow that. So that's why I, I enjoin them to please not repudiate the obligations to the society. But for the government, they are callous, essentially, they don't care. One billion can die in the day, they don't care. The only time they're interested is if somebody that belongs to a member, a member of their family or a good friend dies. Then, hey, you see the government will come up to, with all kinds of thundering statements. Oh, we must do this. Oh, we are going to attack this. But if nothing, if it doesn't concern them, they are silent. They are for law. They must do your business. After all, they told you to defend yourself. That's what they told you. Which is the most ridiculous thing I've ever had. Go and defend myself. Go and have the license to carry my gun. Right. These paper prices okay. have gone beyond the for the seven to eight forty nine. And you said I should go and defend myself. So they have completely absorbed themselves. All right, let, let, let's themselves. move away from so that. Uh, uh, for the want of time. Okay. Opunabon Kutaria, let's move away from that yeah. conversation for the want of time so we're able to, you know, go through some of the headlines this morning on the papers. Now, the issue of uh, zoning and competence and merit has actually surfaced again ahead of the 2023 elections. And you have the fact that Sanusi is making, you know, serious argument for competence and merit and why some politicians are already begin to argue, uh, you know, the issue of zoning and why uh, in 2015 Jonathan actually lost the election. Uh, under the uh, you know party of uh, the People's Democratic, or uh, under the leadership or the canopy of the People's Democratic Party, for not respecting zoning, let's share your thoughts on that. Uh, sorry, I, I think it, it's not quite clear. Are you talking about good, good luck, Jonathan? Okay, so so I'm saying zoning, that the issue of merit, zoning. With, I'm saying that the issue. Zoning, merit, yeah. I'm saying that the issue of zoning has surfaced again, and this time you have Sanusi making arguments for zoning, uh, or, or making arguments for competence and merit, as against the argument where politicians are saying, hey, zoning has to be it, and he's uh, you know, pushing for competence rather than we just zoning. Uh, so I'd like to share your thoughts. And some other proponents have said the reason why um, good luck Ibele Jonathan lost the 2015 election was because the People's Democratic Party at the time did not respect, you know, the arrangement of zoning. Well, I agree with um, um, Sanusi who talked of uh, meritocracy as against zoning, uh, competence as against zoning. Uh, but you see, we live in a sensitive society. Uh, in every zone, you have competent hands. You have competent persons. So you must aggregate, you must marry the issue of zoning delicately because like the, it is rightly pointed out, Good Lord Jonathan actually lost because he felt he was uh, going to take the uh, opportunity of the, uh, the northern, yes, the northern zone. So I want credible persons, I want competent persons, but we cannot just dismiss zoning because the essence of zoning is to ensure unity is to ensure participation. Because if you, without zoning, then only a particular section of the society will rule forever. If you plan it on competence, because democracy is all about numerical strength. 
That's what it's all about. And so the North will have the numerical strength and will forever rule. This is not democratic. If that happens, then it is not democratic. And because others will feel left out, will feel marginalized, will feel sidelined, will feel discriminated against. And if they so feel, then of course you expect that there will be a referendum in the system which might prescribe war, which might prescribe... Right now, look at what is going on even in the, in the south, southeast. What is happening in the southeast? Because they feel they've been marginalized since 1999 to date. So you cannot just reach away zoning. And it is to take care of these issues that even in America you have the college system. The college system is meant to address the nuances, numerical nuances in the system. Otherwise, the particular person will never emerge the president of the United States of America. So you find out that you have the numerical votes, you have the numerical strength, like our God did, like Hillary Clinton did, but they never emerge as president. So these issues are, are, are considered in order to address most of these uh, uh, numerical imbalances going on in the country. Because in every country, you definitely have a particular section that has more persons than the other sections in every country. That is how God has made it. So if you wish away zoning, I tell you there will be a crisis. It will be a prescription for crisis. In every zone, you have competent hands. So we cannot just say, no, let's do I'm talking of confidence. Now, he is talking of confidence because he knows that they have the numerical strength. It's a special argument. On the surface of it, prima facie, you say, yes, there is sense in it. But it has sinister plots. That's the truth about it. He knows that they have the numerical strength. And I believe, because, you know, it was one of them who said the houses must rule forever. I think it was Saldana who said the houses must rule They were planning, he was hinting that under the numerical strength. So you cannot just reach away zoning. That would be a prescription of anarchy. So the Southeast is a clear example. Even in the Southeast, you have a, a competent town. In the Southwest, you have competent town. In the South, South, you have. In the North, North, East, North, Center, you have competent town. And that is why you talk about consensus. An agreement, accommodation will be reached. Clearly, will definitely be a prescription for anarchy. So, yes, we agree, competent down. You have, uh, 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 not all those in the North are competent. Definitely not all those in the North. Not everybody in the South is competent. Well, jo Jonathan was not even that competent enough. He's a brother. A South South man, I can tell you, I wasn't happy with the system of uh, administration. I wasn't happy at all. So, I'm not, but you have competent hands in every zone. So and that is where you have a consensus. For example, are you PDP or APC? APC, okay, fine. Let us look at who we are going to, we are going to take from the South South to placate the South South. The, hypothetically, that's what I'm saying. We are going to take the South South to placate the, the South East to placate the South East. In the South East, who are those competent persons in the South East? That's where competence comes in. But that does not mean you are going to wish away Zopi. No, that, that's completely unacceptable. Completely right. unacceptable. All right. Um, also on the oh, the Nigerian Tribune this morning, there's a story there that says DSS invitation, a plot to silence Bishop Kuka. And that's from uh, Sokapu. Uh, quickly also share your thoughts on that. Oh, oh. Um, um, Kuka definitely has been a thorn in the flesh of the federal government because he has been too vocal. He's, he's one man of rectitude that is highly respected. And whatever he says is given the weight it deserves. But you see the contradiction and irony we are talking about in this country. Gumi has been talking all kinds of nonsense, threatening both the president and the federal government. If the president comes up this morning to say, uh, we are going to crush this bandit, Gumi will come out in the morning, in the afternoon to say, you cannot crush them, you must grant them an What has happened to Gumi? Nothing. Nothing has happened to me. Kuka, the moment he opens his mouth, David says, let us, oh, they invite him, DSS. That is what we are talking about. That is the discrimination we are talking about in this country. And that's why I tell a lot of people, I say, look, Mr. President, people say the presidency, the presidency, we are not the economic what they do. We are talking about the presidency. It's Mr. President. He's an embodiment of the presidency. As the head of your home, if they are talking of your home, they are referring to you. That's all said facts. No sentiment. Forget the rhetoric. So that's why I said Mr. President knows what he is doing. You know, if you remember last year, I said there is a deliberate attempt to silence certain sections of the society. 
the thing is their hegemony, it is their right to rule. And whatever they do must be accepted as blasphemy. No other person must talk. They are gods. What is going on in this country? What has Cook have done? What has Cook have said that uh, Gumi has not said? Or even worse? Why would Jesus have been inviting him? Inviting him for what? What has he said? He has not said anything inflammatory. He has not said anything that would threaten the leadership of this country. Nothing. He kept advising and advising. But Gumi has been threatening fire and bring the stone. That is the president. And he does that with impunity. Nobody is saying anything. That is the discrimination we are talking about in this country. All right, let's quickly share your thoughts uh, still on the leadership newspaper this morning. Uh, Senate traces defunct PHCN's hidden 14 billion naira in accounts. I didn't get that. And it's not, it's not on your screen. Uh, it's on the leadership newspaper. Senate traces defunct okay. PHCN's hidden 14 billion in banks. Uh, it's okay, that's good news. You know, Nigerians, we are used to tracing. Yeah, we trace and trace and trace. We trace a lot. I believe most of them must have been uh, good at, uh, how do they call them? Is it, those that draw very well. At this time, yes, because we keep tracing, tracing, but the outcome of the trace is, has always been the issue. Now they trace it, the next thing they will say they put it into a uh, real um, fiscal, one fiscal um, project, or they use it to settle one that you can never get the real outcome is that you can't ascertain the veracity of how this money is recovered and used. Talking about tracing, no problem. We keep tracing. Yeah, that's look, we trace. We've been tracing. What of the money? After tracing, after retrieving, what have we been doing with the money? So now that they have traced, thank you, National Assembly, thank you. Well, please, let Nigerians know what that money will be used for. And all those involved in that fraud must be brought to justice. It is not just tracing, name and shame them, prosecute them, and let us also know what that money will be used for. Then Nigeria will be satisfied. It is not enough to say you have traced. We are used to tracing. We are used to snake so many billions. We are used to all kinds of things in this country. We want to know those behind the court, prosecute them, and also tell us what you are going to use the recovered route for. We must, you must be accountable. That is what will, the, uh, Nigerians are interested in. Thank you for tracing the money. But we want to know how you, the mastermind goes behind, they have to be prosecuted, and how you will intend to use the recovered loops. All right. Um, open up all in Kotaria. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. Ah. And, uh, Oh, <laughs> <laughs> we need to go. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time this morning. Uh, and of course, we wish you a beautiful day ahead. <laughs> All right, good morning. Thank you. <laughs> And of course, uh, moving away from Tracy and uh, Tracy Chapman and uh, <laughs> other similar words. We'll take a short break. When we come back, we'll be sharing with you what happened on this day in history in 2008. Not very long ago, but of course, still made history. And then right after that, our first major conversation for today kicks off.